Welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. On today's show, we travel to Mankato to attend the Project Abe launch event to learn more about this grassroots effort to create an ag business epicenter in southern Minnesota. Ken Tisi gives us a picture of the overall health of the ag industry, and I get a chance to visit with Ag Commissioner Dave Fredrickson about his recent trip to Cuba. Plus, Lynn Kettleson is back with a story about the recovery of the turkey industry. We've got a lot to cover. Stay with us on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections, sponsored by Alcorn Clean Fuel, a farmer-owned cooperative in Claremont, Minnesota, celebrating 20 years of producing ethanol, high-protein livestock feed and corn oil, and beverage-grade carbon dioxide for resale to benefit its members and their communities. Absolute Energy, a locally owned facility, produces 115 million gallons of ethanol annually, proudly supporting local economies in Iowa and Minnesota. Absolute Energy, adding value to the neighborhood. Farm Connections traveled to Mankato, Minnesota, near the Minnesota River to learn about an exciting project. And with me is Mitch Davis on the steering committee of Green Seam. Mitch, welcome. Oh, welcome to you. Thanks for coming to our event today. Well, this is exciting. We talked about something called Project Abe, and then we launched something called Green Seam. Tell us your part of that. Well, I was uh, one of the members of the steering committee and originally one of the board members of Greater Mankato Growth as this project evolved. We felt like there was a need to inform the general public about the significance, the importance, and you know just the number of agribusiness participants that exist in southern Minnesota. So this project is what the, the evolution of that concept. For some of you, you've been hearing about what we've been calling Project Abe for some time. And for others, it may only be something you've recently become familiar with. But the notion that we are an epicenter for ag production Processing and the continuum of businesses that are part of the ag business value stream is well established within our region. Labeling and marketing ourselves as such, however, is new. All of southern Minnesota and northern Iowa is more than simply a place. It's a state of mind and a state of being. We all have a real and a visceral connection to the land on which we stand. We are intricately connected to the people and the enterprises that support and supply our region. And our heritage links us with the hardworking generations that preceded us. We are indeed rooted in agriculture. The green seam. First, the name. As we listened to a broad, diverse group of people, we heard our region described regularly by those who live here, as well as those that visit, as lush and as green. Others remarked on the region's economic prosperity and of course the green of currency and prosperity that comes to mind from that green. Some noted when you consult USDA maps, farm income maps, geographic maps, that southern Minnesota and northern Iowa has a much more pronounced and deeper green than almost any other area in the United States. So, going forward, we call upon each of you to become champions of green seam looking for opportunities to amplify and tell the story of Green Seam, build not merely regional but national and international energy around this vision, and to align and leverage opportunities that both accelerate Green Seam economically and enhance our global marketplace. After all, each one of you, you are part of the Green Seam. Thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of today's event. Thank you. Well, there's been some comparisons with Silicon Valley, Research Triangle. What's with that? Well, just different regions of the countries that have achieved notoriety and have been noted for um, strengths in certain core industries. And we think this region's strength is in agribusiness. Why? Because of the resources, it started with the land, the water availability, the quality of farmers and production agriculture here, the stewardship, the integrity that goes on with those people and then moving processing closer to the raw material to minimize transportation costs, lessen the uh, effect on infrastructure, and to be more sustainable. 
Well, when you speak of transportation, I think of the highways moving through our area, the river, of course, we're on the banks of the Minnesota River, and in the background is a train. So we certainly have the transportation right through our epicenter of agriculture. We do, and we're fortunate to have enough processing here so they could send finished product out by rail instead of raw material out by truck, and we can add value to that raw material here locally. You mentioned people. Why are people important to the epicenter of agriculture? Well, people are important to just about anything you're going to do in any vocation. And agriculture historically has high quality people participating in it. We want to continue that. And that's why we want to let those that maybe aren't directly involved in agriculture, since I think 2% of the nation farm in a production sense now, we want to let all those people know about the job and the career opportunities that are available in agribusiness. Wonderful story, and thanks for being part of it. Thank you. Good thanks, luck Dan. with Green Seam. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Yep. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections as we interview another member of the steering committee. With me today is Jody Hermer, talking a little bit about Green Seam. Welcome. Hello, Dan. Thanks for having us. What a beautiful oh, day, huh? Perfect. Could have been worse. Well, you've been on the committee for a while. Maybe you ordered the weather, too. Well, I'm not in charge of the weather, but I have been on the committee for a while. About a year and a half, I've been on the committee. Uh, I got on about four months after it started. You're on the steering committee plus some subcommittees. I am. I'm on the steering committee, and I'm also on the promotion uh, action team. So we have four action teams. Uh, one is the promotion team, which is uh, we like to take a little bit of credit for what we've got going on here. Uh, the second one is our business development. And that's really to help people understand what we've got going on here, bring some businesses here, find great places for them to kind of set up shop and find connections. Uh, the third one is our education. We're doing a lot of work with schools, colleges, um, really around a, a, a pretty broad area. Because again, like I told you earlier, we're focusing not only on southern Minnesota, but also, also northern Iowa. So reaching out to any educational uh, institution uh, in those areas to make sure that uh, they've got the connection here with ag as well. And then the third one, which uh, we're gonna start getting some more legs behind now is really around legislation. Mm -hmm. So those are the four action committees. What's with the flags behind this? Now, isn't this awesome? The flags behind us are just a great way to show that really about any business in the area can connect to the green seam. They do connect to agribusiness. Mm -hmm. So if you look back here, whether it's something like uh, farm equipment, financial services, we have attorneys, we have accountants, we have engineers, health systems. I mean, the continuum is huge. So what's the vision going forward? There's been this work for several years, there's committee work, there's uh, expansion into the communities and trying to gather the stakeholders together. Yeah. So here we are, we announced Green Seam, the branding has happened, the logo has been announced, and that's all what's happened just today, just moments ago. Now what? Right. Well, I think now, while we think we've done a lot of hard work the last year and a half, 18 months, um, then the hard work really starts now. Because it's about what we, the community, want to make of the green scene. And so how do we now bring this forward, those action teams that I talked about? The work of each of those is really going to start to encompass more of the businesses that are here, more of the individuals. And I think, you know, we're hoping in... I don't know, even five years when people think of agriculture, they're going to think of this area. Keep up the good work, Jody. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Stay with us. Kent TC is up next with a look at the strength of the agriculture industry in the United States. Thanks, Dan. If there's an industry in the United States that is taken for granted and sometimes underappreciated, it's probably the agriculture industry. The U.S. agriculture industry is truly remarkable and is many times overlooked for the, all the traditions and advancements that have, have helped make this industry the tremendous economic power that it is. Minnesota, Iowa, and other Midwestern states are major players in the success of the agriculture industry. According to the 2012 census, there were 2.1 million farms in the United States of all shapes and sizes. This number has been declining ever since World War II. However, the numbers have been a bit more stable since 1992. The average farm size, according to the 2012 Ag Census, was 434 acres. Uh, and th again, this number has uh, been 
increasing slightly over time. Crop sales in 2012 totaled $212 billion, while livestock sales were at $182 billion. This was only the second time since the Ag Census began in 1840 that total crop sales have exceeded total livestock sales. The other time was in the 1974 Ag Census, another period when crop prices were at very high levels. In 2013, the top five states in uh, ag receipts were California, Iowa, Texas, Nebraska, and Minnesota. Uh, today's, food, today's farmer produces enough food and fiber for their own family plus 160 other people. That number was 19 other people in 1940. By 1960, it had increased to 46 people. And by 1980, it was in producing enough food and fiber for 115 people. Minnesota's ag exports totaled about $8 billion in 2013. This allowed the state to rank fourth, trailing only California, Iowa, and Illinois. The top export products from the state of Minnesota are corn, soybeans, feed, and pork. Exports of wheat, dairy, and beef have also grown rapidly in recent years. One acre of wheat produces about 50, 50 bushels per acre. This is enough wheat to make 2,500 loaves of bread. Uh, farmers today receive about 16 cents of every dollar that the consumer spends at the grocery store. The balance, the other 84 cents, is spent on processing, packaging, marketing, transportation, and distribution, and other costs in the retail food industry. Production agriculture in the United States features a wide range of farmers from various backgrounds, ages, and experience, all with the goal of producing a safe and healthy food supply for the citizens of the U.S., as well as for people all around the world. This is Kent TC, and we'll be back next time. Thanks for joining us on Farm Connections. And our very special guest today is Dave Fredrickson from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. He is our commissioner. Good to be here, good to be here. Well, thanks for joining us. And I recently heard that you were in Cuba. Tell us about that journey. Well, Dan, I always do exactly what you tell me to do, so I came here at your request, and I really, really appreciate it and happy to be here and participate uh, in this discussion. Uh, I was fortunate enough to lead a small delegation of 17 people uh, to Havana uh, and uh, a little bit further out of Havana just to kind of experience the countryside. Uh, thanks to the legislature who uh, appropriated a significant amount of money by my standard, probably small by the state budget standard, uh, to open the door and to examine uh, possible opportunities for Minnesota agriculture. Uh, we, as you know, are uh, actually required by Minnesota statute to do everything we can to promote ag products in Minnesota, and this is just one small part of it. And you do it well. Well, that, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll wait and see what the verdict is at the end of the day. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, our work and, and uh, you know, our presence will encourage members of Congress to look seriously at lifting the embargo uh, that precludes Cuba from moving any product here and precludes the bulk of the products in the United States from moving that direction. And while you're certainly representing a state or a region, some of those answers are back at the federal level, right? Well, they, they are. In terms of the embargo, it is totally dependent upon how Congress views this. We think there is a small window of opportunity in 2016. Uh, we're really fortunate to have two of the primary movers and shakers, Representative Tom Emmer uh, and Senator Amy Klobuchar, both uh, very active and uh, on the issue of Cuba trade and have both introduced bills in Congress to lift the embargo. Whether that happens in 216 will obviously be dependent on uh, the political uh, ramifications of such a move. If they don't, if it doesn't happen this, t this uh, year, I am pretty sure it will happen next year. So, and again, many things depend on the election this fall, obviously. Well, isn't that interesting, the leadership in the upper Midwest, the upper part of the Mississippi River Valley, is leading the charge? Bipartisan. And we've got Florida, 90 miles, from Cuba. 
They have 1.5 million people uh, of Cuban descent living in the Miami area, and so obviously there is a political question. Those are people that left Cuba and left behind everything they owned. Uh, they have uh, in their mind the possibility of going back and reclaiming that. Uh, who knows what that outcome will be. Uh, the new generation is saying, let's move on. Uh, let's normalize uh, trade relations with a country that is just off our doorstep. Uh, you leave the Miami airport and 40 minutes later you land in the Havana airport. It's uh, 90 miles. And so, um, you know, flight time, uh, that means, you know, getting up in the air and getting down. By the time you get up, they're slowing down to get down. So it is so close and there is market opportunity there. Um, we talked earlier about the number of people, 11 million people living in the country, the bulk of them probably on the uh, larger cities, Havana being one of them, uh, on the western side. Um, that's not the biggest market in the world. I mean, if we really want to pay attention to markets, pay attention to Mexico. There are more people that live in and around this Mexico City than live in the entire country of Cuba. But it's an important uh, uh, relationship that we need to reestablish uh, in Cuba. I'm old enough to remember the Cuba Revolution. Uh, I remember 1959. I was 15 years old at the time, and of course we didn't have instant communication, but we did have a newspaper, and we did have the radio, and so uh, we paid attention to that. I'm old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. I was a, a recruit in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri uh, during that time, and I can't uh, tell you how fearful all of us were that this could be doomsday. We've got nuclear missiles looking you know, uh, looking at uh, the United States. So uh, I went there with maybe a little baggage, uh, but what I found was people uh, welcoming you with open arms, saying, help us lift this embargo, help us normalize relations with the United States, our closest neighbor. And David, what would that mean to the average Cuban citizen if we were normalized trade? Well, I think first of all, uh, the first shoe to drop would be tourism. Um, I think there, uh, there is a pent-up uh, desire for Americans to go to Cuba and see what it looks like. You've seen the pictures, you've seen Hemingway's favorite bar, uh, uh, you've read Old Man in the Sea, uh, you've seen the old cars traveling up and down the street. There is this uh, romantic draw to Havana. And I, I think that if we, if we normalized relations, opened uh, the country to, if they open the country to uh, uh, tourism and we open it up so we can go, uh, they're speculating somewhere in the area of six billion dollars of annual tourist traffic. And while you were there you said you felt welcomed. Can you give us a personal interest story at all? Well, uh, I, can, I can just say that uh, the people that we had the opportunity to talk to went out to a farm. Uh, a young man with a PhD, because you get free education in Cuba, you get free health care, but you get also $20 a month, and that's what you're going to live on, plus you get a, a supply of food every month uh, by going to the commissary and getting your allotment. Uh, so they, they don't have a lot of spendable uh, income. Uh, this guy uh, wanted to um, examine some of the uh, things he learned in college, and he has a PhD. I think there are more PhDs per capita in Cuba than there are anywhere else because they can continue to go to school free, and if they're good at it, they move all the way through and uh, end up with, uh, with PhDs. Uh, he organized a farm. They literally dug a well by hand. Uh, they terraced uh, uh, the area, picked the rocks, made walls, had some of the older people my age working in the fields uh, and they're raising vegetables and they're, they're uh, coming up with some kind of a food hub uh, where other farmers will be able to move product through the hub and then that hub then will sell into some of the higher uh, end restaurants and cafes and uh, spots in the larger city and this is his idea. In order to put that to work he had to go to the government and present his plan. Keep in mind the government owns the ground, all the ground, all of the buildings owned by the government, the houses owned by the government. 
Um, and he had to present the plan and the plan had to be okayed by the uh, government officials and then they would give him 15 years to go out and develop this farm. He'll never own the land, uh, so there's no incentive there. The only incentive was him putting his knowledge uh, in practice. And he was totally excited about this. Uh, uh, he had two oxen and a big ox cart, the kind you would see on, you know, before a little house on the prairie. And that's what they used to uh, move uh, product back and forth. Uh, it, you know, it's pretty primitive. And so I don't think you're going to, if they do open it up, you won't see the door fly wide, op wide open. They're very careful in that they want to look at uh, strategic partnerships. They want to own 51%. They want partners to come in at 49 That may not work for some U.S. investors that want to do business there. So I think it is a slow dance, uh, but it is a continuing dance. Fascinating. We are also sending ag products to them now, food. We do. Things like corn, soybeans, soybean meal, poultry products. The farmers that were with you, any feedback from them, any reactions? Well, their reaction, uh, particularly the commodities, you know, obviously they want to sell more product. Uh, we sell uh, soybeans. Uh, as you say, we sell uh, some wheat, not as much uh, now as in the past. EU, uh, the EU has been uh, providing that market. We've lost opportunity, obviously, in the last 50 plus years. Uh, and one might say, how's that working for us? And one would have to say, not so good. And so if we're going to do this, then you have to go in and reestablish those markets, reestablish those relationships. And I've found uh, that in dealing with our international customers, you have to develop that personal connection. They want to look you in the eye. They want to take a me the measure of you. Uh, they want to get a sense if they want to deal with you. I remember going to Taipei uh, here a few year, a couple of years ago uh, just to make sure that they knew that we were interested in their biennial purchase of grain. They buy in excess of $3 billion of U.S. product, U.S. grain, every two years. And so they always come uh, to the country and they do a big signing, uh, MOU signing. And so I went there to ask them uh, that the next time they come to Minnesota to do the purchase, if they would come to Minnesota, or the next time they come to the U.S. to announce it. And, and uh, as I left the meeting, I said, no, I hope you come to Minnesota, uh, because here's why. It would be so important for our farmers to be able to have your acknowledgement that the product they raise is plentiful and that it is of high quality and that you can count on us to uh, guarantee that that product will be in, in your hands. It's affirmation for our farmers that they're doing a great job. The guy looked at me as we left after I uh, suggested that they indeed uh, come and, and accept our invitation. He said, well, we probably will. And I'll tell you why. You're the only one that came here and invited us. Right. And sure enough, last year they came and announced $3.1 billion worth of sale. And of that, we probably end up with 8 to 10 percent. I mean, they obviously buy from the U.S. grain bin. They don't buy from the uh, Minnesota mm -hmm. grain bin. But we add our product to that U.S. grain bin. So we benefit. A wonderful story. And thank you for taking our personal, wonderful farmers to Cuba because you're growing a market for today, but also for tomorrow. They, uh, you're very welcome, and I don't think I could ask for a better company. They kept me out of trouble. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner Fredrickson. Thanks Absolutely. for joining us. Absolutely. Good to see you again, Dan. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. Up next, Lynn Kittleson reports on the recovery of the turkey industry following last year's avian influenza outbreak. Turkey producers across the country went through some very tough times over the past year with losses due to avian influenza. But with increased biosecurity and quick action by the industry, the outlook today is much brighter. In fact, in many areas, turkey production is up, and that's good news. Everything's ramped back up, and along with that, a, a lot of biosecurity changes went on on many, many of these farms. Halverson says the turkey industry ramped up their biosecurity after last year's avian influenza outbreak. 
as Minnesota Turkey Growers Association, you know, we were aware that there was a possibility of the outbreak a year ago, two years ago, a year and a half ago. And so we did put some processes into place and many of those worked and we were after the outbreak, we were able to make some changes that uh, India, Indiana actually just used and limited their um, continuance of outbreak. Turkey producers and the entire meat industry are important to other segments of agriculture. The livestock industry in Minnesota is, a, is an amazing powerhouse of economic drivers. Uh, livestock in Minnesota drives over $20 billion worth of, of output in the state. And, and those dollars not only help the price of soybeans, but they also help the, the uh, infrastructure of our city, our state, uh, in, the, in the entire uh, country as, as a whole. So livestock is the number one customer for our soybeans. Just a year ago, the turkey industry was reeling from the impact of avian influenza. The industry reacted, and so did farmers, with new biosecurity measures, new and stricter standards for people getting on the farm and off the farm. Now they're celebrating National Turkey Lovers Day once again. The industry is back in business and expanding, and the news is good. This is Lynn Kettleson reporting. That's it for this week's episode of Farm Connections. If you have an agriculture story to share, email me at dan at ksmq.org. We're always looking for good ideas to showcase the agriculture sector in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. Thanks for watching.